I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. So who do you reckon the founding fathers of Australia are? Well, there's Captain Cook, of course. There's Arthur Phillip, who decided where Sydney should be. John Batman, who laid out Melbourne. But let's give it up today for two founding mothers, Mrs Farrell and Mrs Kennedy. Excuse us. Who, you may ask? Well, without them, none of this, what became the richest city in the whole world, would have existed. Where is it? It's Bendigo, of course. But first, I've got to get down from here. See you in a bit. Australia, Bendigo. Plenty of gold here, and not just below the ground. I'm off to the theatre to play writer Mark Twain. It's my show, so I get the biggest part. The strange case of the underage spy and the mini minor. So you went home and told your parents? I was young and naive, yes. <laughs> and guerrilla warfare that saved a humble tram. This is Che Guevara. <laughs> So it's 1851, and while their husbands are off working, Mrs Farrell and Mrs Kennedy are out walking. That walk put Bendigo on the map, because they found so many gold nuggets lying by the tiny river, they filled their stockings with them. One way or another, I reckon their hubbies were in for a nice surprise when they got home. It's true, I feel like I've done half the walk already, whoops. What's odd about this place is that it shouldn't really be here. Let me explain. Bendigo was an absolutely barking mad place to build a city. At the time when Mrs Farrell and Mrs Kennedy were staggering around with all those nuggets in their knickers, this was the only source of water in the whole place. Now, it's been raining recently. You can see all that grass in the cracks. Nevertheless, there's virtually no water there at all. But loads and loads of people, thousands, were attracted here because of the possibility of finding nuggets or alluvial gold that they could pan. But eventually that ran out, and that was when phase two of the Bendigo goldfield started as epitomised by this mine here. It's hard to over-exaggerate the amount of gold there was to be found underneath Bendigo. This is a walking graph, right? If most of the gold fields had about that much gold, and Ballarat, which was a big one, had, say, that much gold, then Bendigo had about this much gold. And in order to get it, the amount of engineering that was deployed was colossal. See, they would drill down up to a mile deep. About 5,000 shafts underneath Bendigo, and because there were so many seams of gold, around about 37 of them, they would drill out in every direction, always chasing the gold until the whole place was honeycombed by tunnels. Even today, Bendigo is like an enormous Malteser, except that it, it's not round and it's not covered with chocolate, obviously. It's a, a metaphor, but... Hang on, what's that? Hey, look at that, look at that! Yeah, there's a cable. There's a cable going up there, uh, going round to into this shed. Hello. Hello. Can you come a minute? Can I ask you about this stuff? Yes, yeah, certainly. Is, is your name Carl, or is that just the name of the boiler suit? No, that, my name is actually um, Carl. Yes. Carl, 
This machinery is really impressive. Was that brought in from England, from the north of England? No, no, it wasn't actually. This machine was actually built here in Bendigo in 1896 by a local foundry. And we actually exported machinery to England and also to places like South Africa and America. That's typical little imperialist me, isn't it? I assume that you were sent this by us Brits. Oh yes, and that's generally what most people think. They think it's made in England or America or somewhere like that, and they're quite shocked when we actually say, no, it was actually made here in Bendigo. Can you show me a bit more of how the whole place works? Yes, yeah, certainly, shall we? In today's money, Bendigo produced $28 billion worth of gold. But as the water table rose and the market price dropped, mines were closed and then demolished. Deborah was preserved as a link to the city's past. These things I really love because they give you a, an incredibly vivid impression of what life would have been like in Bendigo at the height of the gold rush. They're called stampers and their job is to smash up the quartz or the ore in order to get the gold out. Carl, can you turn them on so we can demonstrate what they're like? See what I mean? These things operated for 24 hours a day. But what's really bizarre is that when they were turned off on a Saturday evening... Nobody could sleep because they were so used to all that terrible noise. Thank you, Carl. See ya. It's funny, when you're confronted by all that extraordinary mining equipment, it's a bit like seeing the skeleton of an elephant in the sand, isn't it? All that power and it's gone so long ago. But there are lots of other very powerful stories in Bendigo. And to be frank, a lot of them are even more fascinating. Come on. I can't do this without you, can I? My walk's taking me to a house on Carlin Street, a few blocks over from the mine. I know I've only just started, but all this walking's making me thirsty. Hi, Laurie. G'day, Tony. Good to see you, mate. Good to see you. Can Could you? I have a look down in your cellar? Certainly. Come to that. Laurie is the owner of this place, but it's not him I've come to see. I'm interested in what's at the bottom of these stairs. It looks like a bomb shelter, although it was more likely a good place to get bombed. It's a 19th century wine cellar, and I'm meeting a bloke to find out about a cheeky little 19th century Bendigo drop that got right up the Europeans' noses. Stuart. Ah. Oh. Thank you Harry. for inviting me to your tasting. Pleasure. These Bendigo wines in the late 19th century, they were incredibly well received internationally, weren't they? Indeed, yes. Uh, particularly, at, I think it was the very first uh, completely international in exhibition, which was uh, in Vienna in 1873. The uh, judging panel, uh, composed mainly of Frenchmen, were totally blown away by these wines and would not believe that they were colonial wines. They were quality indeed. wines. Oh, indeed. In yes. which case, why was it? that the Bendigo industry died out. The major thing that destroyed the wine industry in Bendigo was the infestation of phylloxera. It's a minute aphid type uh, insect that sucks on the roots and, and it just eventually kills. They go into decline and the vines die. But that's not the end of the story, is it? Because you've been instrumental in yeah. bringing the industry here back to life again. Yeah, for my sins, yes. Which is why I've lured you here in order to uh, try and taste a bit of your wine. Why not? Why not? Is this the one now, that, that we're tasting? Uh, I, I thought I'd show you that one. This is an 1880 wine from Bendigo, and this comes from this cellar. Wow. It came from this cellar. So you reckon that that wine might taste all right? Yes, but I'm not going to show you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but you can taste one from 100 years later. Well, thank it's you very much. This one from 1980, and we can drink this one. Oh, this is gorgeous, isn't it? Well, to a flourishing Bendigo wine industry once again. Thank you.
Cheers. Thank you very much. <laughs> See you again. Oh. Cheers, Laurie. It's a nice spot of wine for you down there. Cheers, See you. And now back towards town. The Sacred Heart Cathedral in Short Street looks really weird to me. And not just because it's so flaming big. All right, it's gothic, but it's all hard edges, like something out of a cartoon. I suppose that's because, unlike European cathedrals, it's only 150 years old and hasn't had the chance to become softened, weathered and rounded. Maybe if I come back in another 150 years. Just round the corner here, there's a piece of architecture that's almost the exact polar opposite. This wall certainly has been softened and weathered and rounded. It's the last remaining wall in Bendigo built in the old Chinese style. Because in the 1860s, there were as many Chinese on the Bendigo goldfield as there were Europeans. But then when the surface gold ran out and they were excluded from the mines, then they had to move away or get other jobs like making and laying bricks. You can see that these bricks are... Hang on, this one comes away. Look, they're, they're much smaller, aren't they, than the standard Aussie brick. Although I better put this one back before anyone sees because this wall is actually heritage listed, which is a good thing, although... Let's be honest, it is quite a ropey old wall, isn't it? It's hardly the Great Wall of China. If I'd been alive in the 19th century, I don't think I'd have had the guts to cross the globe in search of gold. But I could see myself getting up on stage to entertain the locals, which is exactly what American writer and humorist Mark Twain did back in 1895. Don, we all know who Mark Twain was because of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, but whatever was he doing in Bendigo? Uh, he was on a world tour to uh, pay back a debt, a big debt, $100,000. How did he lose all that money? He lost it um, by investing unwisely in a, um, a typesetting machine which he thought would make him fabulously rich, but he lost a lot. So he was schlepping all around the world just to pay back his debt? Yeah, um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, India, Ceylon. And something very odd happened in Bendigo, didn't it? Yes, well, he met a man who he calls Mr Blank. OK, stop right there, because this is a theatre, so we're not going to tell you what happened next. We're going to perform it for you. Don, get your acting shoes on. <laughs> I should have told you about the lack of my acting shoes. Right, I'm going to play Mark Twain because it's my show, so I get the best part. And on the night in question, Twain is addressing the audience. He finishes, there's rapturous applause, and then, Don, this is your big moment, onto the stage comes another man who was... Mr Blank. Exactly, at least that's what Mark Twain called him. But then he admits a bit more about himself, which is... That he is the, uh, the president of the uh, Mark Twain Society of Corrigan Castle, Ireland. Whereupon Twain's stomach sinks. He knows about this society. Why does he know about them? Because they've been sending him his, their proceedings and their, uh, their speeches and everything that happened to them for many years. Which was very flattering, first of all. Very flattering, but then he found the task altogether too onerous and burnt the lot. Because they were sending so much stuff. Yes, he burnt them as they arrived. But in the meantime, the characters of all the members of this society had burnt themselves onto his mind. He wrote about them in his book, Following the Equator. We will demonstrate those characters tonight with the help of the Bendigo Historical Society. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim, Chris, Robbie, Terry and Darren. Now, Jim is playing Naylor, who, according to Mark Twain, had a polished style, a happy knack of felicitous metaphor. I think he's doing that very well, isn't he? Chris is Forbes, who was courtly and elegant and deployed scalding satire. Palmer used virile, eloquent abuse. Norris was wholly without ornament, compact and lucid. It's the beard that does it, isn't it? And Calder never spoke when he was sober and spoke all the time when he wasn't. And finally, of course, there was 
Mr. Blank. And his job was? To take the minutes. Exactly. So, during the course of the evening, they continued their conversation until Mark Twain admitted that he'd burned all the papers and stuff. Whereupon Mr. Blank made an admission too, didn't he? Yes, that he was the author of the whole thing. Exactly! There was no Mr. Naylor, Mr. Forbes, no Palmer, nor any of them. They were all a figment of Mr. Blank's imagination. Imagine what a humiliation that must have been to Mark Twain. At the beginning of the evening, he was the most famous man in the world with a massive fan base in Ireland. But by the end of the evening, that fan club had been reduced to one nutter. Mr. Blank. Or Mark Twain, let's face it, they were all figments of his imagination, weren't they? Very likely. <laughs> mm. If Mark Twain could dream up Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, then he could definitely make up a load of old twaddle like Mr. Blank and his imaginary fan club. Well, thanks, Tom. See you guys. Thanks a lot. <laughs> This is Bendigo, a city full of gold. We found it underground, by the bottle, and up on stage. Now I'm heading into the centre of town. It's time for me to go deep undercover. Imagine the scene. It's the summer of 1962, here on Bendigo High Street, and there's a man pacing up and down and up and down, and in the curb, there is a mini right here. Up and down he paces, up and down, and eventually he puts his hand on the door, opens it, gets in, and begins talking to this man. Philip, who was the mysterious bloke and what did he want? He called himself Mr. Mac, and uh, he said he was uh, an ASIO agent. Which means what? Uh, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation. And were you aware of that organisation? Never heard of it. Forget the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Cold War had come to Bendigo, and ASIO was recruiting new agents. The younger, the better, apparently. I was 19. So you're a bit young, really, weren't well, you? Young, young and naive, yes, yes. So you went home and told your parents? Yes. Mr Mack said, well, here's some papers. Uh, you're too young to uh, sign them yourself. The official secrets act? Of course. I had to take them home to my mum and dad for them to sign, which they said, you know, are you sure you know what you're doing, Phil, you know? And I, to be honest, I said, well, I, I'm not... Absolutely I'm no not, idea. No yeah. idea. So no more hanging around in cars anymore. You had to start going to meetings. That's right. <laughs> Who were the people you were spying on? Communists, Tony. What were they like? They were just ordinary, everyday people, or working class people, between 50, late 50s to early 60s. So getting on? Getting on him, yeah. It was more than 10 years since the communists had had any real political clout, and Philip's targets were its senior citizens. Anyway, on to Bendigo's historic Hotel Shamrock, a traditional stop for royalty, VIPs, weary travellers, and soon-to-be ex-spies. In 1986, Philip's ASIO minder summoned him to a lunch on the balcony. So you'd had the meal and a bit of small talk. Yeah. Then what did he say? Uh, that you're no longer required in the organisation. Thank you for your service, but please don't ever contact us again. So you were completely cut adrift? I was absolutely cut adrift and gutted. Do you feel that that 23 years was wasted? To be honest, I do. In the beginning, I thought I was doing the patriotic job that I thought I was doing. Looking back on it, it was just a sheer, complete waste of, of time and money that the organisation spent, you know. What I find so extraordinary is that all this should have happened in a little town like Bendigo. Exactly right. Well, thank you for sharing that extraordinary story with me. I hope this meal has been slightly more cheery than the one all those years ago. <laughs> uh, Tony. Goodbye. Goodbye. Philip's such a gentle and sweet guy. I didn't have the heart to tell him that in the 1960s, I used to hang around with Marxists and communists, and I was demonstrating against the Vietnam War. In fact, if I'd been living in Bendigo at the time, it would have been me that Philip would have been spying on. 
There's another little story about the Shamrock Hotel that really tickles my fancy. This is the room in which I'm staying while I'm in Bendigo. This is my bed. This is my desk. Here's another little bed in case I have a friend to stay. But that's not the story. The story is that this room is known as the Dame Nellie Melba Suite because this woman, the internationally renowned opera singer and diva Nellie Melba, came to Bendigo in the early years of the 20th century to perform and slept in this very room. And she was woken up in the middle of the night by this noise. It was, of course, the clock on top of the post office, and she was incensed that she'd been disturbed by such a cacophony and ordered that it should be switched off, and it was. And you can imagine that must have been something of an affront to the people of Bendigo, who'd laid out a lot of money for that clock. But on the other hand, she was a musician, and it is a pretty terrible chime, isn't it? Anyway. Once it was switched off, she was able to have a good night's sleep, woke up the next day thoroughly refreshed, went down to the Royal Princess Theatre and sang her heart out. The old girl could really punch out a tune. I know this is supposed to be a walk, but I'm going to cheat. I'm going in this. Let's go! I've jumped aboard this tram because, just like my old Marxist mates, I love a good cause, especially one that goes back to the heady days of the 70s. Did you guys know that there was a time when the council wanted to get rid of all the trams? Do you think that would have been a good idea? No! no. I think we're starting a revolution here. Well, the story of how these trams were saved is right down there at the depot. This is the depot, and it was here that the act of civil disobedience that I told you about at the top of the walk took place. Dennis, why did the council want to stop the trams? No, the Benigo City Council wanted to keep them. Oh. It was the State Electricity Commission of Victoria that wanted to get rid of the trams. I pointed the finger at the wrong people. I'm sorry, <laughs> councillors. It was the Leckie who wanted to do it, yeah, right. What happened in 1972? The SEC finished the trams and they wanted to get rid of every one of them, but we weren't going to let that happen. So what did you do? I was a school teacher. Yeah, 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 I was yeah. teaching a class and one of the uh, volunteers came and said, look, they've got a truck and they've lifted up the tram to go to Adelaide. And I said, no way. So, all right, no way, but what did you do? Oh, I rang up a group of friends, all the tram enthusiasts, and we came down dead night, pushed the tram back in the depot. Hang on a minute. You pushed a tram like this from here through to there? Exactly. You must have been mad. Uh, hold on. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry to bother you again, but Dennis and his mates Push the tram just like this into there. Can we see if we can do that? Yeah, Come on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, go on, Dennis. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> that was fairly useful. Again. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Not an inch. <laughs> so that was supposed to be a historical reenactment. It was absolute failure. But Tony, you've got to realise we're 40 years younger and the adrenaline was pumping in us so we could do almost anything. Sure. You managed to get the tram from here through to there. Then what? We pushed the tram in the depot, welded pipes across the track so it couldn't move. I took the carbon brushes out to immobilise it. Then the doors were welded. These big doors here? Exactly. So when the blokes from Adelaide came here the next morning to collect their tram, what happened? Well, the whole depot was full of people and trucks and cars, and I'm very sorry, the transport had to go back to Adelaide empty-handed. So you orchestrated a complete mass civil disobedience? We certainly did. This is all your fault. This is <laughs> Che Guevara. <laughs> no, Che Guevara's dead. I'm still here living oh, in Bendigo. I'm glad to know that. <laughs> well done, mate. Good Cheers. on you. Excellent. <laughs>
Thanks, guys. Thanks for everything. Right, Even though it was completely fruitless. <laughs> Move the tram, but we have crisscrossed about six kilometres of this lovely country town in about half a day. And I'm finishing up in Rosalind Park, right in the heart of Bendigo. It's a beautifully kept city with lovely green open spaces, a thriving art scene, and loads of stories about wine and opera singers and great writers, and even the occasional spy. So if you do come here, be careful, because you never quite know who's watching you. Ah. <laughs>